everybody. Welcome back to the Consummate Athlete Podcast. I'm Molly Herford, and when I am not outside doing one of the sports that we talk about, I am inside writing or talking about it on this podcast. And I'm Peter Glassford. I'm a registered kinesiologist and an endurance coach, and you are here on the Consummate Athlete Podcast, where we talk to movers and shakers, movers and coaches and experts of all types uh, who do different sports and movements and, and sort of... T- try and take some of those things back to the sports that you do and try and motivate you to do amazing things. <laughs> that one got a little off the rails at the end, but I like it. Experimental. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, so what's what's new? Well, uh, we're starting to get into a bit of that blending of end of season and into the, the picking up of the season. You know, people have maybe chilled out and taken a bit of a break here. Uh, and now they're getting excited about, dare I say, the new year. Yeah, new year, new me. I'm actually, I just got the proof for the Canadian Cycling December issue that's going to be out pretty soon with um, my New Year's article in it. I'm so excited about it. I I can't even offer any spoilers because I'm afraid I'll ruin the entire thing by dropping yeah, I the believe, big spoiler. I believe... Overhearing you talking to Matt Pioro, who you can listen to on the Canadian Cycling Podcast, uh, and he thought you were being sarcastic or joking when you said you were really, you know, excited that they needed someone to to write the the New Year's piece, and you were you were being serious. You don't under- understand sarcasm actually very well. I do not, but you um, know what? I love a New Year's piece. Like I know, I know they're typically really cheesy. I'm not gonna lie; like they are cheesy. But you know what? There's a reason that they come out every year, and it's because people are still clicking on them. People still buy them, uh, whether you want to admit it or not. Like there is still something kind of great about the new year that like new calendar chance to turn over the fresh leaf no matter how corny you think it is it is a pretty i don't know it does come every year it is a clean way to kind of get into a bit of reinvention Um, i think for athletes especially like those in endurance sports who have summer seasons the new year is actually pretty awesome because it's that chunk of winter motivation that you know you maybe wouldn't have otherwise right like if you take away new year and new year's resolutions all that stuff um what are you left with you're left with like a six month block where you're not racing and you know it can be a little harder to stay kind of focused on your your goals and stuff but at least with the new year it kind of presents itself as this natural sure restart of a cycle and a little bit of like a reminder to okay maybe you know maybe i did go a little a little hard on the Christmas buffets or whatever, and maybe now it's time to kind of throw sure. in a couple more salads, so, et cetera. So, so this uh, episode, we're going to do a bit of sort of end of season, mm-hmm. uh, which we've done a little bit in past years as well. But as I say, it, it comes every year. Um, so we well, have a couple of questions from the listeners. Thank you for that as well. Mm-hmm. Um, speaking of seasons being over, I'm not going to lie. I am pretty stoked that mine's over. Right. You finish your season, your running season. Yeah. When uh, when the last episode released, we'd actually recorded it before I had my last race of the season, a 50K trail run. And you know what? I'm not going to lie. It went awesome. I was so happy with it. It's it, The back-to-back 5K and then 50K in two weekends, I think actually worked really well for my body because when I started the 50K, I think my body was just like, oh, good, 5K. We can do that really hard. Uh, so my, my plan was to kind of just try to race as fearlessly as possible and just sort of see what would happen if I, you know, actually just wasn't super stressed on bonking or fading at the end because I've never really tried to race anything other than like conservatively. So I knew I could finish really strong. Uh, so yeah, I had a 30 minute PR, which was, yeah, really awesome. Did you, uh, fade? So I didn't fade, but I will admit, so most of the course was pretty technical trails, I'd say, but then the last five miles were on towpath. So just on... Just like a rail trail. Yeah, a rail trail, very hard pack, um, and just a straight shot, and holy crap, it was so boring. I kept thinking I was running like 12 minute miles because it just felt so, just like such a slog, and then I'd look down at my watch and I was, you know, putting out like eight minute miles, and I was like, oh actually going a lot faster than i would have expected at this point but it felt awful but then i have to say like the race um so it was the trails for tails which raised money for um some animal rescues in titusville new jersey which is pretty sweet and the organizers 
you know, despite it being a pretty tiny race, like they were pretty dialed as far as their volunteers went. They must have been like on the phones with each other um, from aid station to aid station. Because when I came in with like half a mile to go and there were marshals like pointing me to get on the uh, bridge to go over the road, uh, they all were like screaming my name and it was the coolest thing ever. Uh, one, I, I have no idea who the guy was, but he had the most booming voice I've ever heard. So it felt like um, at the end of Iron Man, where there's that one guy that classically will like shout out, you know, you are an Iron Man. It felt like that guy was just screaming my name. Right. Uh, it was really cool. I forget. So. Was that guy at Iron Man the year we did it? I think so. Yeah. Yeah. I would imagine so. Or they just have a recording. Do you remember hearing Peter Glassford, you are an Iron Man? Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> I was hoping they wouldn't. I was going to like run. Like around yeah, the Yeah, around line. the thing so that they couldn't say it or something. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. All right, Peter. I have a question. What's your question? How can I support shows like this one? Oh, it's that time of year again, is it? <laughs> okay, we admit, like every other show on the amazing Wide Angle Podium Network, we are not naturally gifted um what's the word like what npr Sa- does salesperson salespeople, um telethon people right but that does not take away from the fact that we are putting out tons of really really great content you know every single week says you says me and a lot of our fans right so wide angle podium is the podcast network that we're part of it is a member supported network um, and it's been around for a bunch of years now we're on year over three now yep and we we moved our podcast onto it in like in the first year that we were out right um it's got other great cycling podcasts cx harris is the the big flagship one for mm-hmm. sure and slow red podcast or are we the flagship one i mean for the endurance sport world as a whole i'd say we're the flagship one we're the only oh. non-cycling right episode on the network also I think it's us and CX Harris are tied for the most consistent shows on the network right. as far as putting out content every I, single I week. I know a few of my clients who are mechanically minded really like the... Uh, bike shop. That's the one I always have it in my head and then it disappears. Bike shop CX? No. Just the bike shop. That's not the name of that podcast. We oh. have screwed this up again. Oh, no. You need to go check out the name of this podcast for us um, and remind us. Um but there's there's that. There's also the slow ride is a big popular one. A lot of clients like that one too. It is Bike Shop CX. Oh, that's what I thought. There yeah, you go. There yeah, you so go. apparently they have a good humor. So if you're into more humor than I can provide. I mean. Or uh, more so you're into things of all things mechanics, I guess. Um, they've had some good. They had Mark Compton on or Mr. Katie Compton. Yeah, I love that episode actually. Yeah. So how could someone without going too far down a rabbit hole, how, how could someone donate or, or help out the podcast network? Yeah, there are a couple ways. You can head over to wideanglepodium.com slash donate or just head to wideanglepodium.com and you'll see plenty of links for it. Um, and for either five dollars up to 50 bucks a month you can you know choose your own if you think about the fact that you know you get four episodes of our podcast four episodes of cx harris four slow ride you know tons of other ones that's actually you know less than you know 10 cents a podcast at that point like at the end of the month so for five bucks a month you're getting a ton of content or you can do a one-time donation pretty much every little bit helps like we were just talking about it before we hit record and over the years we've spent you know tons of our own cash on you know upgrading our sound equipment getting the right software to put the stuff up it's you know it's not free for us it's not free for the network um and we don't run ads we're really picky about it we've turned down a lot of ads on you know for brands that we just don't necessarily think are good fits for us or our audience uh so you know suss that out yeah 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 and and you mentioned that there's bonus content oh yeah or you didn't mention i didn't mention well i don't know i thought that was your thing but uh yeah there's and all the years so even if you're just don't or you're just starting to donate this year for the first time you do get previous year's content when we've put up a couple extra interviews you've got a couple resources of what were those resources you put in there a couple years ago uh some free ride comfortable ride happy so from the saddle sore book so 
awesome. Yep. Some nutrition stuff as well. Just a bunch of PDF handouts that are ones that I usually use. If you come to one of my talks, you'll get them. But that's really the only other way you're going to access them. And then they've added a couple bonus episodes from a few of the different podcasts. I think Bike Shop CX actually just put one up. Um, now that we know the name of their podcast, but there's also Aero Race Pins, uh, which I guess are I, I had thought this was like a button. No, they're but, but literally it's a, it's pin. It's a pin like a, that you are putting on your numbers. Mm-hmm. Wh- so this could be for good for our running listeners. Oh, and if you recall a couple podcasts ago when we were talking about cyclocross gear and like the best way when to you told us how to super how aero. to put the pins in. Yeah, if you go back to that episode, these pins actually make it almost impossible to not. Put your jersey I have on, never. Put your bib I mean, on I'm going to have to donate to our own show so that I can get these pins because I, I don't I even know what these are. I've never heard of them. Yeah, I actually saw a few people at my race this past weekend using them. The wide angle podium, not arrow. the wide angle. Well, podium. you should have just said they were. This would have been a better sales pitch. But you saw people using arrow pins. Mm-hmm. Okay. Well, I learned something. So thank you for. Let's. We've got through one. All right. Awesome. So let's get into, we have a couple like mailbox type follow-ups from previous ones. So why don't you want to, let's start there. Yeah, for sure. Uh, so we had hand numbness was a question there, maybe two Q and A's ago. No, I think that was our last Q and A. Okay. Uh, we had a mountain biker who was just dealing with some numbness in certain fingers um, after rides. And we sort of talked through a bunch of different options from bike fit to nutrition to clothing. Um, Tons right. of different options. And so it turned out that, in fact, grips were pretty worn, pretty, like, road-styled, like, big drop on the handlebars. And what was the other thing that they said? I need to remember this. But they, they anyhow, they corrected this. It seemed to be helping. And, and there was, in fact, those, those risks. Oh, bigger gloves, I guess. Mm-hmm. Maybe they weren't wearing gloves. Yeah. Yeah, it's funny. I think, you know, you and I talked about this. I write about it in Saddle Sore, Ride Comfortable, Ride Happy. A lot of people are just really nervous about tweaking their fit, even if they feel like something's wrong or just don't feel that great on the bike. A lot of people are not willing to kind of take that responsibility into their own hands. So they either, you know, just suffer in silence or they wait till they get a bike fit or they get a bike fit and just assume that the bike fitter is this genius who knows every tiny little in and out of their body um when really like ultimately i think bike fitters are amazing and i think everyone should go get a bike fit but you're going to be the best judge of how a bike fits you not any random bike fitter well i think any of this you know we could do the same thing with maybe you know some sort of test with cycling or running um you know it could be a symptom if you're dealing with an illness of some type but a lot of the stuff is like you it's very to make it personal you almost need something to go wrong you need to have a symptom wrong so to speak um so oh i'm having hand numbness well now we have this like bunch of things we can try because we know that there's too much pressure on the front of your bike on the handlebars so then we can try and shift that load or you know disperse the load is what we're thinking with the the grips or the the gloves maybe right but we also what was the saddle tilt for this person was what it was so the, they're sliding onto their hands so it's like, well, can we make the saddle less tilted down, you know, because we have this symptom. So you almost want to be looking for the small problems. Yeah. And treating those as a good thing that you're getting some sort of like, oh, OK, this is what it seems like. You know, we, we've sort of put ourselves into the the norms, the you know, what we expect is a decent cycling position. Um, but until you go out and get some more symptoms, it's hard to customize things. Right. Um, so I think it's, it's good to think of that in that way when you're, you know, you're doing maybe your, your seasonal testing, which we might talk about here as far as getting going with 2020, um, you know, and, and there is no bad, there's sort of like, this is just, you know, the sprint side of that didn't do well, the endurance side of that didn't do well. Okay. That's a, maybe a little clue as to what type of training we might want to do. Yeah. Okay, so good. So thank you for following up. Uh, the other one we got to follow up on. Didn't we get another follow up? Yeah, it was about uh, the injury. So it was a different guy following up regarding our recovery from injury. Um, oh, right. And it was super interesting because he, you know, he heard us talk about injury recovery. And, you know, you and I kind of went into a bunch of different other like alternatives to riding bikes that were a lower impact and you know yeah. talking about swimming and strength training and all that kind of stuff yeah uh, well this guy has almost a more extreme example and you know is kind of looking for some more advice uh, so he actually has 
um, an actual broken broken leg would you call yeah it? i mean don't, you don't need to get it too specific but yeah but to where he can't walk around there's zero mobility yeah like not walk mobility in the sense of like moving around the house or even just like getting out of the house right mm-hmm. yeah uh which does present problems but i sort of the i think the main thing I, I get sort of we went back and forth a little bit but um you know i was googling around and you can find some like wheelchair type fitness not that this person's in a wheelchair um but there's a lot of neat stuff out there as far as wheelchair and progressions for people with paraplegia yeah you were really surprised to realize just how many resources were out there that are you know kind of for basically different different able-bodied individuals and you know all of the different the full spectrum of you know whether you can't use your legs or you can't l- use an arm or something like that like mm-hmm. there's tons of resources out there now like i mean i know we always say it but you know youtube has a ton of great resources well uh, for yeah both <laughs> good and bad um but there's definitely some stuff and i think the other side of this is that you know w- this is sort of we have another four weeks to go for this person maybe and so we're sort of preparing ourselves to be ready to go through you know whether that's a a sort of progression in physical therapy progression in training um so there's things you know we talked in the previous one about goal setting but it's also you know putting a focus on cooking we talked about a little bit you know making nutrition's really good you know can we get some more sleep and start getting back on top of that um, and just trying to treat this time away from main sport, away from even activity, um, you know, to, as sort of a, an opportunity to sort of look at different things we wouldn't do otherwise. So hopefully that person, they seemed like there was maybe some options there. Um, yeah. So thank you again for that person for checking in and for listening. Okay. What else are we going to talk about? I think it's it's time to talk about that question that I mean you've been getting from a ton of clients. So, you know, cyclocross nationals are coming up. The New York City Marathon is coming up. So, for a lot right. of people, first weekend in November. First weekend big, of November big weekend. is a big end of season week for a lot of people. And I mean, a lot of people also just have the off season looming. Whether you're like basically, unless you're an elite cyclocross racer in North America, your season is going to end in the next five to six weeks. Um, because, you know, at US, most, U.S. is the beginning of December. U.S. Nationals is like December 9th or something like that, like the first, second weekend of December, basically. Yeah. So, yeah, your, your, your season's coming to an end. I think that's, that's pretty much where we're at. And then we're going to be hitting the holidays. So this is a really tricky time of year, right? Because on one hand, we want to celebrate the off season. We want to take that break. We deserve that break. We think we deserve that break. Um, but we're also coming into the time of year where it's really easy to go off the rails in terms of unhealthy behaviors, office parties, family sure. parties, vacations. And there's probably two buckets of people. There's probably the people who don't want to lose fitness, which I would put myself chronically or, or historically. I was in this bucket of just like, well, I just won't take an off season and I'll be more further, you know, I'll be further ahead than everyone. Ah, that's good math. And then there's the people who, you know, maybe are legitimately just burnt out from the season. They got a lot going on, as you say, holidays. And, you know, they plan to take a day or a week off and then it turns into like six months. They haven't, you know, exercised or something. Right. And there's maybe a middle ground as mm-hmm. with most things. Yeah. So I think there's, so I mean, maybe the first question is, do you need an off season? So I think that's maybe the first point to address. I think we could say kind of across the board that everyone who's training consistently, and maybe you can speak to what consistent training and racing looks like, can do with an off season. It's just kind of whether that off season is, you know, maybe a week away from running or riding, but you're still walking around and, you know, making a point of maybe doing some easy yoga or stuff like that. Um, and that can be, you know, seven days, that could be a month, just kind of depending on what your season looked like. But could you maybe speak to like how consistent one should be training before one considers an off season? Cause I know a lot of very casual people who'd be like, Oh yeah, I'm taking an off season when really they've been, if you actually, you know, boil down what they've been doing, they've been training like two days a week. I think most people could, you know, I don't think a week's a big deal. Some people might have a week, you know, they're away on family vacation or that could be Christmas or something like that too. Um, but I think it is good, you know, even just the, 
example we were talking about just previously with the injury, a lot of us rely so much on that exercise, which is good, but we also want to be careful that, you know, we're able to take care of the other elements of life, you know, be balanced, consummate athletes uh, as we go through. So, I mean, I think for a lot of us, if you're a runner or something, you could certainly take a week and just in that time, because it's always a question when you're addicted to something, what are you going to do? What are you going to replace it with, right? I often feel like if you don't want to take an off season, you probably need to take an off season. Sure. That's maybe a good, good rule of thumb for sure, right? And you can probably see that fatigue built up in sort of, you know, training stress or something like that. But for everyone, right, there should be some sort of undulation and change in the focus. Um, even if you're a year round runner, right, maybe you're going back to more of a lower intensity and then a higher intensity or 5k season to marathon, marathon season. Um, you know, cyclists might be going from indoor season to outdoor season or, uh, you know, hopefully they're doing some cross training. So maybe it used to be that we would do sort of base one where there's more skiing and hiking and this sort of stuff, just building that general aerobic conditioning, you know, maybe backing off supplements, backing off some of the sugar and getting more, you know, before we got all crazy about fat, um, you know, just having more whole foods and less of the sugar powders for a phase of aerobic training, right? And this is, this is old. This isn't like, this now seems like it's revolutionary, but I was just thinking like this was in Chris Carmichael actually had, which is, you can't say Chris Carmichael. Dun, dun, dun. Um, but some of the old CTS books will say. Sorry, uh, I'm just picturing me bleeping this episode. <laughs> probably. You can't say. Um, yeah. So the old, they had a thing and I, I don't know that Joe Friel ever really did, but certainly Joe Friel was, you know, early on the paleo diet for athletes and stuff like that. Right. So just this phase of the year, right. Where we're sort of just backing off of the intensity. I will freely admit. Yeah. Like actually, as I was finishing the 50 K in my head, I was kind of like, whew, I am actually really excited to like not want to eat tons of crap constantly. Um, because yeah, I mean, uh, this summer, because my run volume has been higher, I've probably, you know, ingested more like simple carbohydrates in the form of, you know, tailwind or gels or whatever than I ever have. Um, because that's the only way I can really fuel my runs like, reasonably. I can't really do solid food on the bike. I could do more cliff bar y type, like mixed medium snacks. Um, but this summer is the first time I've really put an emphasis on fueling my running. And while it's given me some of the best performances of my life, like I am really happy to put away the tailwind for a while. Right. Right. Yeah. And I think, you know, that's, that's normal. I think it comes a bit with the elite level performances especially, but, um, well, yeah, I, I didn't want to turn this necessarily into a, a nutrition thing, but I think that is part of the, the phase of the year. Right. And it's maybe an example for all of us. Um, you know, where we sort of shift the focus maybe towards dietary stuff for this phase of the year, especially with the holiday season. Like you say, a lot of us have work parties and family parties. If you can try and sort of get on to a good sort of routine, there might be day to day, like a day of disruption, a meal of disruption, but you can still have that good framework, that good base, so to speak of, of good nutrition, you know, you've got your veggies and your protein and so forth. And I mean, I'm not talking about like cutting out everything entirely. It's not like I, you know, flipped a switch the second I crossed the finish line and was like all salad all the time. I mean, I swapped my croissant for some like steel cut oats. Sure. Sure. Yeah. And I think, again, we're just trying to recharge motivation. We're trying to recharge, you know, just shift the load on our body to something slightly different. Right. And that's, I, I love the the Dan John, everything works for six weeks, right? So if you've been pushing something really hard for six weeks, whether that's racing or a certain type of training, you know, you sort of need to mix things up periodically. And that's why the classic, you know, three weeks on, one week off, three weeks on, one week off. Um, you know, that's why that's sort of roughly been around now, right? And, and why that's so, so common. Yeah, I think the other thing I'd say about taking an off season is I would love to see more people take an off season where they stop recording data as much. Like whether, mm -hmm. you know, whether that means you turn off the Garmin and you just go for like a chill bike ride and you don't you don't see what you did on Strava. So you're not gonna see where you were on that segment. Or, right. 
I mean, it makes me shudder as a coach. I'm not going to call myself a data scientist at all, but someone who collects a lot of data and likes to look through data, um, I would say just put it on a different screen, but some people need to disconnect. I would say I, I had this conversation earlier. People, I guess, post to Strava. Maybe it's, I guess it's for the, the data analysis, we'll call it. Um, but when they're doing stuff indoors over the winter and I was like, I don't really even understand, but I guess that's the point is that it's like you, you get some graphs and stuff for free. Well, and a lot of people use Strava as a training log, right? I guess. Yeah, I guess that's what it is. But, um, all that to say, like trying to take some of that competition and that, you know, we're concerned about the times not to put another Dan John thing. Someday I, I got to email Dan John and try and get Dan John, I guess, but. Or just apologize for stealing all his stuff uh, and mentioning it on here. We credit him though. So I always really do. Stealing. I try and do that for anyone that we're doing that to. Um, but he has his bus bench workouts or, or phase of the year and then sort of the park bench, right? And the park bench is when you're just sort of there enjoying the process. Um, whereas the bus bench, you're concerned, when is the bus coming? What are the times type thing, right? So race season is bus bench and the a large majority of the year for most of us should be this park bench. We're just showing up every day, enjoying the, you know, the scenery We're you know, having a good time. But then when you're getting close to competition, then that's where we start caring more about things. Right. And I think sometimes pulling anything, I don't want to pick on Strava, but that's sort of a, a common thing where, we care how we're stacking up and people, some people get really into that, right? Yeah. Okay. So maybe you're right. Like maybe just covering the part of your screen that like isn't, you know, the time or so, like whatever metric you happen to need to see to sure. do your ride. Or just changing the focus, right? Maybe. Yeah, for sure. And I'm, yeah, like I think there's, there's something to be said for that. I know for me personally, it's one of those when we're on, you know, our one vacation, I'll take a few days where my coach is aware that I will just not be upload or like mentioning things or putting in daily training right? because I just want to be off the computer for a few days. Sure. It's, it's not like no offense to him, no offense to anyone, but like, you know, trying to actually take a few offline days. And I think for a lot of people that's like myself included here, that's really hard to do. Yeah. Yeah. And then you do, you don't want to give up the, the routine, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, change is hard for sure. Um, but your hope is that you're sort of letting the body recover. You come back with good motivation and a recovered body that then, yes, you'll be slightly less fit, but then you can go back and start, sort of start making progress and, and ideally, you know, even to a new level. Whereas if we just keep going, you sort of just are plateaued, right? It, it's hard to ever make a, a boost up to a new level. Totally. And I think there are like a bunch of weird little tiny things too. Like even honestly, like this is, you know, a super personal one, but you know, like a weird chafe mark from your hydration pack, mm -hmm. you know, it's like under your arm or something and, you know, taking a few days off like that finally heals. Yeah. It's um, amazing. The stuff that heals. Uh, we were talking about <laughs> the blisters on my feet, my big toes right now. <laughs> yeah. And ever, so many people have things they're nursing through. Right. Um, I had a client I just was on a call with and he, uh, he actually ended up getting sick, like just, sort of bad cold type thing. So I had to take a bunch of time and work was busy and, you know, as things get, um, and he had been dealing with an Achilles thing, trying to race some cross, you know, that sort of stuff. And which is not great when you're jumping on and off a bike and running up steep Hills when you have an Achilles like ankle type thing. Um, but then, you know, a couple weeks just not doing anything really. And all of a sudden Achilles is better. Right. And he, he did go for some physio and stuff too, but sometimes the, we are, under or uh underappreciate i guess the the benefit of just doing nothing right mm -hmm. yeah. greg, greg layman actually who's been on the podcast i saw him he's he's sort of been on a, a thread recently about sometimes as physios chiros you know movement professionals will say uh we we underestimate the the benefit of doing nothing sometimes and how things sometimes will heal in time mm -hmm. you know whether someone's poking you know you know massaging or whatever you know the injury area yeah manipulating all right before we get into the last part of our questions here just a reminder wide angle podium donor drive only goes on for a couple weeks it's actually right. almost over by the time this podcast comes yes, out we've delayed our, our advertisements for you guys 
Yeah. We'll actually even throw up a super special bonus episode to celebrate the end of the donor drive. So look for that coming in the next week. Um, but Did we agree to that? I agreed to that. Oh. Like us. This is this is not through Wide Angle Podium. This is just like consummate athlete. Like oh, bonus so we have edition. a teaser. Do we have to say like if we can get a certain number, we're going to redo this? Ooh, I mean, we should, but I feel like that yeah. metric is going to be a we, pain we, in the butt. We believe you guys are going to do something. We believe in you, yeah. Someone's going to do it. Okay. But someone's anyway, going to do it. You got to do it. You got to do it. You should probably do it. Um, Wideanglepodium.com slash donate. Arrow pins. Arrow pins. Yep. Um, again, you can donate between five and 50 bucks a month. Bonus content. Five bucks is nothing. Like, it's literally one cup of coffee. The bonus episode we have on there, one of them at least, is with Jeff Proctor, right? Mm-hmm. I always felt like, you know, that's behind that firewall. Only those donating members get it. Mm-hmm. But it's a good episode. It really is. Yeah, he's a smart guy. Yeah. Oh, I was just have... thinking about him on my ride today. Yeah. yeah. I wonder what he's doing. Well, I, I was thinking about going for walks on camps is what I was thinking about, uh, which is not necessarily his idea, but something that he definitely sticks big two he's a coach for u.s cycling and led a lot of the u.s development camps for cyclocross so that's mm-hmm. bonus episode behind that wide angle podium in the wide angle podium vault surrounded by arrow pins <laughs> and oh, that's dear. at wideanglepodium.com slash donate Awesome. All right. Okay. Last part of our question here. So when you're dealing with new clients, I mean, this is coming up a lot. People want to start thinking about 2020 already, but the problem is a lot of races haven't maybe announced their dates. Right. Or, I mean, it's just, you know, at this point, like we're, you know, in almost November, but it's really hard to think about like date specific stuff for, you know, April, May, June, for like August, September, like, it's really hard to Why start is it thinking. hard? What do you mean it's hard? Well, planning around stuff, I guess. Because, you know, if you don't necessarily no races, have... You know what dates they are, roughly. Roughly, but not all of them have put up. Like, if you recall, I was really keen on the Under Armour Mountain Run series last oh, year. And I mean, then... yeah, trail running's a little more, right? Yeah, yeah I get you. That series didn't end up going. So I had kind of put a lot of eggs in the basket of, like, I marked down, like, what weekend it was going to be. Yeah. And then suddenly it's not existing. Sure. So it is a little tricky when you're starting to kind of think through what you're going to race in 2020. Yeah. So I think there's a few things like my my flippant response to you was, you know, there is last year's schedule. Some races are historical. We know November 2nd, 3rd, that first weekend in November, New York. Um, historically, we've had our cycle across Canadian nationals. Okay, part B of that question too, though, um, a race like the New York City Marathon requires getting in, or maybe New York City doesn't, but Boston does. Sure, sure. So now, you know, or Leadville, you have a ton of clients that do or want to do Leadville. Yeah. So how do you plan for Leadville 2020? For next year. Yeah. Well, then you know you're going to have to look at the qualifiers and you know you're going to have to enter the lottery. So, I mean, in some ways, it's nice when there's these races because they've just built the season out for you, right? Some clients, you know, they'll they'll look long-term, right? Like, that's a big, like, bucket list. I'm, like, pausing our recorder here. Uh, hopefully, you guys are still with us. Uh, so, yeah. So, in that case, then you know, okay, for anyone in Ontario, New York, Wilmington is a nicely timed one. It's – now I'm blanking on the day. It's always in May. Is it May or June? Now I'm blanking. Mm, planning 2020, not so easy after this is, all, I is never it? forget these things. So let's say, anyhow, there, it, there's a qualifier in May. There's another one in June. There's a Texas one in March. Um, and then there's a really there's a couple others. And then there's a late one in uh, July, which I don't like because it's a little too close in May. But it's not, it's not bad. But that'd be like a last ditch ever. You would never say someone should do that as like unless a they live right there. It's not so close. It's a huge issue, but it's a little like it's a. I think it's a. It's the Lutzen ninety nine er. So it's like a hundred miles basically. Um, yeah. So anyhow, that's really specific to Leadville, but that would sort of make your season right. And and you maybe have a plan B if things don't go well. You know, you're hoping to get in the lottery, but these sort of qualifiers you're hoping to get because I think Boston similar probably gets your. Where, what pen you're in and stuff, right? Yeah. 
Ooh, I have another caveat about planning 2020. Well, let's not get too crazy here. <laughs> this is a really important one. Oh, okay. Well, there's layers to this question. There's so many layers to this question. I think a lot of people start planning their 2020 or, you know, just next year uh, without consulting their partners or families. Sure. Great it's one. really, really tempting to be like, oh, this is my this is my race season and then present it, uh, you know, four months later but like your coach is much more aware of what's happening than your spouse is yeah um so i think when you're thinking about planning 2020 it's super important to sit down and actually like discuss that with your yeah. family yeah too many people you know it ends up you get to crunch time and there's a whole bunch of stress um because they maybe didn't mention that well or, or what's involved out. in that as far as training or travel or, or this stuff right so it's it is some of the stuff's pretty big commitment when you have everything else going on so you know sometimes less is more um sometimes tying it in with family stuff can be helpful sometimes not now i know it's going to differ for every different racer and every style of racing but do you have like a a number of events i mean there's there's definitely like an upper limit of like when someone's just like here's 30 things i want to do next year that's Pretty obviously common. Yeah. common and unrealistic and then there's also the person who's like this is the thing next year period yeah we, we mentioned there a few episodes back about meb um the marathon running runner who had 26 marathons and he's known for the marathon but 26 marathons in his entire career and he's not that young no, that was over like 15 years, I think, roughly. Yeah, so like two marathons Like a full a career, professional marathon running career. Um, yeah, and that's that's very common. Like marathon is a big wear, but they're doing two-hour marathons, you know, plus. Um, you know, these are not four hours. They are not ultra running like you. They're not, um, you know, like it's... So it's running, it's not cycling, so the load's a bit heavy, so maybe cyclists can do a bit more. But he's also the elitist, like in the like one percent of one percent of best marathoners in the world, right? Like, so it's tough when it's like, oh well, I'm a cyclist, I can do more. Yeah, but you're also like a working person in their forties, with you know, or fifties, or or whatever, and you know, you have a kid and work and the stuff, right? So I think the best thing I did, and I'm you know mid thirties, the best thing I've done in the last few years is just race way less. And just show up as prepared as I can be, which is not always as prepared as I want to be, but as I can be, and super motivated. Because when I was trying to keep up with what I used to race as far as number of races and the amount of travel to get them, I was just getting grumpy and wasn't wanting to be there. And I was tired. And I really like sleep for me as I am a baby if it goes under like probably nine hours honestly i can attest to all of this you were terrible so for the first couple and, of years and, and I, I say that i am but i think we're all we all need sleep we're all working trying to work we're all trying to balance whatever we got going on so i would just race less and it's tough because it's tied to a lot of our social stuff and you know everyone's strava goals but if you can pick you know the people that are like leadville and the qualifier um new york marathon and the qualifier and just draw those out and maybe there's a couple local things sprinkled in there it leaves you so much more time to enjoy your training and prepare well um you know that can include some fun runs or rides or whatever you do with friends you can go to the gym with friends you can you know there's lots of room to socialize without necessarily racing but then show up at those races and do a really good job and feel good about it and get good experience this was the first summer where i actually did in, like instead of doing races i mean i had i think three different marathon distance runs that i did that were either like solo as just like you know fake race effort right. or just with a friend and honestly that was the most fun that i had this summer mm -hmm. uh, was approaching you know those kind of pretending they were race days but it was instead of going to a race to hang out with a friend we just did our own marathon and, you know, had some friends come for the first sure. chunk of it. Like she and I finished it together. We had a great time. It cost us zero dollars. We got to pick the course. Um, so I think a lot of people try to put that like emphasis on, oh, we need to do a race together or, you know, this is how I see friends. But right, right. I think a lot of people would probably be really psyched to be like, oh, wait, you don't want to do the eight hour, but you want to go for an eight hour like sick gravel adventure to like these three cafes with like our five best friends yeah something like that and i mean the difference between running a 
marathon for training versus a race right it's like you don't drill yourself into the ground mm-hmm. um you know an off-road versus road and the fact you're training for a 50k versus right like that's just the difference in the event but um valid point for sure there's lots of things you can do and that's what i was leadville is a great example of like i hope that you're excited to ride a mountain bike on gravel hilly terrain but you're hoping that there's adventures along the way in this like we're mapping out to august so that's what are we at 10 11 months I'm hoping that in that year, you're going to have so many things that you really enjoy before you even get to that race that like the year was a success and you've learned so many things that in the future years, you can either do just more of those fun gravel adventures of mountain bike, gravel, whatever you want to do, but you've maybe learned some other things along the way, fueling, navigation, um, aero position, like I'm trying to think what else you learn in Leadville, but well, and training should feel good enough and like, you know, um, complete enough that even if the race doesn't go the way you want it to, you still don't finish the year with like a bad taste in your mouth because you've had all of these other good experiences. Yeah, from which it. is always like, it's not cliche, but you say it and you're like, no, but like I'd be pissed, right? But um, if it doesn't go well, like you're not happy, you no. know, but. Uh, and you might go back or you might not, but I think you want to think about that whole process, right? I have a post called, can you prepare for the goal that you've set? So you talked about, um, uh, spouse, family, not being super into your goal. Well, that's going to really limit right before we even talk about your wattage and, you know, everything else, your, your threshold, like if your, your family's not into it, that's going to be super stressful, right? If this is the the year you're moving your parents into a, you know, long-term care home, maybe not the best year to like really drive hard on like big travel races, right? That could be a dream goal, you know, a, a goal for f- two years, five years that you're building towards. And then this year we could really work on as you're working on uh, personally, you're working on your 50 Ks this year. We weren't so stressed about going to Leadville, you know, you're just learning to run, building capacity, right? So in the same sense, I have a couple clients who are looking at pretty big Leadville-esque, Kanza, Dirty Kanza-esque. Um, one's looking more even just like more of a like a time trial type goal, but like two years out. And, you know, we, we're going to tick away at that this year with events and with training. And everyone's hopefully excited about these things, right? And, and so you sort of can really map out into the future and which direction are we moving you know, what type of person and athlete do we want to be down the road? You pick the target, the rough, fuzzy target in the future. And then this year can be still important, the seasonal goals, but then how do those sort of feed into that rough direction, right? And this would be like you would set goals at work. Some people have said that to me, you know, that at work they have this, this sort of annual review, but what are we looking for in five, 10 years? You know, I'd like to progress towards you know, a, a vice president type position, you know, what, it, what are the things I'm doing this year? They're sort of building towards that or what is the company's vision in 10 years? Mm-hmm. Right. So some people have it from sort of that perspective, but I think even as a, you know, a, an adult onset runner, cyclist, you know, someone who's doing this as a master's age grouper, we're going to look at the same thing, right? Like I would love to be at Kona. I don't actually want to go to Kona, but Kona Ironman in five years as an age grouper, say I'm going to go when I'm 40, so as I, your spouse, I would like to uh, heartily right, disagree. But, but you don't have to rush, right? And that should set the course of, okay, this year I'm going to work on sprint triathlon and maybe one half, um, half Ironman, and then, you know, go from there. And, you know, this is going to feed into some swim training, whatever, right? So also along the lines of like picking your 2020 races, I think right now, if you haven't figured out like which races you want to do specifically, it's, you know, you can maybe think about just like what kind of races, you know, like, oh, I want to do two marathons or I want to do a marathon and a half. Sure. Uh, so even just kind of like get as specific as you can right now. But if you can't necessarily figure out the like travel and well, you know the what? dates and stuff, yeah. I think even just starting with that basis. I have two things. I just put in like May 1st and August 10th. There's an event and that's like a race, a race, and then it'll move plus or minus, right? But that takes care of a lot of people, basically, especially in cycling. That's sort of common. Um, those two sort of junctions. You mean like when you're kind of planning out the bare Yeah, bones. if someone is in the boat that you're describing, I'd like to do this type of racing. And again, it depends on the exact type of racing because those dates may move. But it's funny how like 
you know, around the first day of spring seems to be like that May, you know, May, the weather gets nicer in most places. And then that long weekend or that uh, just after the long weekend, like Leadville's August 8th. Um, what else was that weekend? Like everything we had local hundred miler, hundred K type race here. I felt like that weekend is always, there's just way too much going on. A couple yeah. big Ironmans are that weekend. Yeah, it was a big weekend. Um, Which is weird because it's not a long I don't even know what US. I was doing. For some reason, I think I was doing something. But anyhow, I think there was a World Cup for mountain biking that weekend too. So anyhow, that's just sort of when things are. Middle of summer, you know, plus or minus. It might be the long weekend. It might, you know, be our nationals are July 20th about. So when I'm sort of mapping out backwards, which is what I'm going to get to here in a second, I just sort of pick rough targets. Hopefully you have some you know, rough idea of what you're going to do, um, you know, based on previous years. And then you can sort of start into the process. Like we're so far out that you can adjust a little bit. And what I, I try and get people, especially if they're trying to self coach or sort of just design their self out. Like I used to always get just a calendar, you know, the local real estate agent's going to give you a calendar for Christmas or something. Um, so you get one of those paper calendars that no one wants anymore, I guess, or it's on the back of your fridge already. And do you have put it on the back of the fridge? That'd be a <laughs> Side really of the weird, fridge? yeah. Uh, back, back of the door, back of the closet door. And so just put those events in, circle them in big red thing. And then you can just sort of count back in four weeks. We were talking about three weeks on, one week off. And you can just sort of go back through and mark those. You know, this is going to be the race block. And then we're going to do our build. And then another build. And then a base. And a base. And if you want to pull it like an old one of the Joe Friel books or something to sort of get, if you're you know, sort of super knowledgeable on that stuff, but, you know, sort of just map out how much time you have and what you're going to do. And then the important part that Molly mentioned right off the, the bat was check in with family. When are the family vacations? What is going on at Christmas? Um, what else happens? You know, there's just things with work, you know, what are the things? And then from there, you've sort of made this whole calendar and we now have today, we have the goal in the future we have the limitations as far as family stuff. And then now you have a little bit of an idea of like, what can you, what do you have to work with? Right. And then you can sort of map out, okay, well maybe before Christmas, you know, I'm going to have this week where I can hustle a little bit more, put in a bit of a like long weekend block. I really like or something. You can start planning those in, um, you know, and pretty quickly you've sort of mapped yourself out a whole season. Uh, I'm trying to think of other books that would be good, but the, the Joe Frill books are like the classic. Like if you go through that, it'll lay out exact like hours and stuff. And it's a good exercise to do um, either using a calendar or like a sheet of graph paper or something. Yeah, no, I really, I really like that. Just making sure you kind of combine all the calendars because I think way too many people and I'll include myself in this just have sport goal is just so far removed from the rest of their life. Um, but really, it's all holistic, right? Like, you know, your stress at home and your stress at work is all going to, you know, change your athletic goalposts and sure. you know, how much you can you can train. Well, I guess the week. yeah, and I think the other thing is if you so I started with the the race goals, which may make sense. But I think what you might also see, and, and this is very common in that post I was talking about the can you prepare for the goal? It's like family goes on vacation all of July, but you're going to race Leadville on August 10th. And it's like, okay, well, you just, the four to five weeks before your race, you're not going to be able to ride a bicycle. This seems very stressful, right? A little problematic, yeah. So this year, could we focus on, I mentioned Wilmington, but there's like a lead, I don't know if they do Leadville stage race anymore, but they do say a Leadville 50 miler, or there's a Colorado 50 miler or whatever. Gain some experience this year. It's still really hard races. There's lots of hard races. Pick a different one. June... June's a big month around the summer solstice, say June 24th, you know, you're going to do, we have a big 24 hour race, 24 hour solo, June 24th, and then you're going to take a recovery week and then you're going to go on your full July vacation. Awesome. Right? No stress. You're probably so burnt out on riding a bicycle because you drove it so hard. April, May, June had an amazing race and now you can be hundred percent present on your vacation and you're not trying to like ride a hotel bike. And then next year, maybe, you know, there's some discussion. I really like this Leadville idea. Maybe we can do family vacation after Leadville, August 10th to Labor Day. Beautiful. It's a mm -hmm. two week or two year. Now we're going to need a two year calendar from the local real estate agent. Don't know that they have that. Yeah, they've stopped doing them. Yeah, I don't think they do two year. They, they want you to buy now. Sometimes so. they do like 14 months. 
they want you to buy the calendar early, right? You get two months bonus. Ooh, yeah. All right. Well, we've gotten a little into the weeds. Uh, <laughs> well, let's... Ho- I hopefully, hopefully that's useful. Yeah. Uh, we'll link to a couple of these posts. You said you had one or, or you were mentioning one. I know you have a bunch. We'll try and link to a few of Molly's like New Year's resolution type ones just because it relates to setting goals, setting mm-hmm. habits. I think that was the thing last year, right? Habits yeah. are the new goals. Uh, and then I'll do my, can you prepare for the goal that you set? And my recent uh, off season posts, sort of what is off season? Why do we do it? What do you do during that time? You know, and transitioning back to training after. Awesome. And you can find the show notes and more over at wideanglepodium.com, where you can also donate to the Wide Angle Podium Network. You can become a part of the Wide Angle Podium Network. Right. And really help shows like ours and the Slow Ride Podcast and CX Hairs keep putting out all of this content week in and week out. Great. Awesome. All right. Well, without further ado, we will wrap this up. Uh, you can find us over at theconsummateathlete.com. You can find us on social at Peter Glassford and at Molly J. Herford. And I guess people who are coming up for Pan Ams or Canadian Nationals in the coming weeks can find us likely at both. Yeah, absolutely. So definitely. come on up, say hello, show us your arrow pins. Mm-hmm. Uh, and yeah, good luck to everyone with the final races or the, the resumption of training after your off season. Ooh, how about this? Yeah, if you show up at uh, Nationals and Pan Ams and or Pan Ams with your arrow pins or pre- Proof of I think this proof is proof of donation. Yeah, yeah, it's going to push the wide angle podium shifting methods. I think, yeah, to say that enough. might be pushing it a little. Although up. maybe Bill will be there and he can give them in person. Proof of donations, and we will hook you up with so much Shred Girl swag and other fun stuff. So oh, yeah, definitely come by and say hi. Uh, thanks as always for listening, and we will see you next week.